Hello, everyone. Welcome to our series of expert conversations. It is Tuesday, and that means we have Jonathan Twomley with us. How are you doing, Jonathan? I'm great, Michael. How are you? I'm doing very well. You just love it when the market gives us a layup of a topic to have. Uh, the Fed came out today with a half a point <laughs> emergency rate cut. Uh, you know, we need to talk about that. What's it mean? And, you know, this recession talk is coming around a lot more. So I think I have our two topics for today. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Those so are let, good topics. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the half a point rate cut. Let's talk about the rate cut itself, half a point. Kind of, we have both seen that probably only a couple of times over the last a couple of decades, right? The half. Then we can mm. talk about the emergency cut. What does it kind of mean? Uh, lots, lots to unpack. Uh, so when you saw the first headline, what was your thoughts? Well, I wasn't surprised because they had been talking a lot about this, about whether this was going to be a possibility. So I wasn't surprised that it happened. Um, but I am quite skeptical about it in, in the following sense. Mm -hmm. um, for, now, I'm not an economist. I'm just kind of someone who follows stuff closely and reads a lot. Um, Me too. And I like economics. <laughs> you know, I, I, I find it a really interesting time. You know, in an alternate life, I think I would have been an economist uh, instead. Yeah, I mean, like if I, instead of being a attorney, history major in college, <laughs> yeah, and an attorney, I would have studied economics. Doesn't mean I would have, wouldn't have gone into multifamily ultimately. Yeah. But I mean, I think like for the first career, I would have, really enjoyed studying yeah. uh, behavioral economics. Actually, yeah. well. Little known fact, I don't think I've ever shared on my YouTube channel. My undergraduate degree is economics. It was the oh, really? yeah, most fun topic uh, subject I had as a freshman. And yeah, I dove in. I'm, I'm an econ hardcore, you know, uh, I guess it's a BS degree. And yeah. then went back and got an MBA because, uh, again, economics is always uh, a cool topic. So, sorry. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's funny. I went and started an MBA also when I was in law school oh. and, and quit. I didn't really like the MBA program very much. Um, but, and I think the reason was I thought what I was getting into, because I was totally ignorant about this kind of stuff back then, I thought that what the MBA was going to be about was like more about economics and like trade ah. policy and stuff like that. And I didn't realize how much it was going to be about like, Here's how you use your HP calculator. <laughs> yeah. And here's how you run, do, ex, do Excel. And like, here's how, let's do these marketing studies with yeah. all these weird. Like, yeah. Dual entry accounting, double entry accounting things. and all that. <laughs> yeah. Like all this stuff, which is, you know, it's totally, you know, look, if you're going to run a business, you need to know all that stuff. But that wasn't what I thought I was getting in the MBA program was more like a PhD in economics. Yeah. yeah. I was totally wrong about it. So, so I, I quit anyway. Um, and another regret, I wish I hadn't quit that, but still uh, cool. I did. So I went, went double down on the law and uh, that was a mistake. But anyhow, <laughs> um, so I started, so I started answering the question. All right. So this is a really long winded tangent. Um, <laughs> All right, so so here's here, here are my thoughts. Uh, from from what I'm understanding about, well, first of all, look, we don't know if a recession is going to result from coronavirus or not, right? Mm -hmm. However, if it does result from coronavirus, it's going to be, from what I understand, what I'm seeing now, is it's a supply side led recession, which is really unusual. Usually recessions are led from the demand side where demand mm -hmm. dries up and people stop buying. Mm -hmm. So the typical medicine that the Fed would impose is like, well, let's make it cheaper for people to buy stuff by reducing rates and get them spending again. Yeah. However, if a recession results from the coronavirus, it looks more like it's going to be because factories in China are shut down which just has a ripple effect throughout the economy because it means that then American factories can't get their parts, right? They can't, so they get idled and all those people are put out of work and stores don't have stuff to sell because it's not being shipped from China. Frankly, I actually have two friends, two close friends who are both small, in small manufacturing businesses and they're both being affected. I mean, first by the tariffs, the tariffs are really screwing with their businesses badly because mm -hmm. this stuff gets, you know, it, all their stuff is made in China and nobody else makes it. It's not like the mm -hmm. tariffs, like, like, Oh, well, well it, now it's cheaper to produce in America. You can't make the stuff in America that they mm -hmm. make, right? Nobody makes it anymore. Mm -hmm. And even with the tariffs, if you could find somebody to make it, they couldn't make it for the price point. So they could never make it cheaply enough here to sell it at the price point that their distributors 
mm -hmm. require them to sell it at. So basically they're out of business, right? If they can't, if, if they can't figure something out, but this coronavirus thing is, is acting the same way or even worse because now it's not just that they have to pay more for the stuff that they sell. They can't get it. It's like, mm -hmm. it's either not being made at all, or it's sitting in a warehouse somewhere in China and can't be shipped. Yeah. Right. So no, you know, they could cut rates to negative and it wouldn't make a difference mm -hmm. because the stuff, because that, you know, a 50 basis point rate cut is not going to put people in China who are out of work because their factories are closed down because of coronavirus back to work. Like if a 50% rate cut could you know, make cure coronavirus, maybe that would work. But, <laughs> but since that's not the case, yeah. then I, this strikes me as really kind of like the federal reserve engaged in, in do something ism. Right? Yeah. We got to do something. Right. So, and this is the only thing we can do. So this is what we're going to do. Yeah. I, and, and I think, you know, similarly on say like the tourism side of things, right. Uh, you know, somebody, I, I was on Facebook before I jumped onto our call kind of mucking around with uh, Lou Harnbuckle, you know, you probably know him and, yeah. um, and we were kind of going back and forth about like, you know, how much, what percentage of a rate cut would we need to take our kids to Disneyland and expose them to coronavirus? And we we're joking around. I said, yeah, 50 basis points is enough. But if it were a full point, yeah, I would put, I would put my kids health at risk ah. if it were a whole point, you know, and, and just kind of like to, to, to illustrate yeah. the kind yeah. of futility exactly. of, this kind of, of this kind of move. So yeah. I don't think that this is going to help much uh, in yeah. the general economy. No, it, it, so as, an, as somebody who studied economics and got a degree in it, there's, there's a couple of things that you're right. I think this is a, a do somethingism. I've never heard that statement. I'm going to steal that. That is awesome. I didn't make it up, but you can steal it. I'm going to so steal it anyway. I got it from you. That's all that matters. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, it, it, it's certainly starting as a supply issue, right? Factories in yeah. China are shutting down. Shipping lanes are shutting down. It's just, it's just stopping. What is interesting about supply-led issues when you sort of go back and look at them is they generally lead to inflation. Yeah, of course. Because right? yeah. at some point, some people need some things and at some point they have to buy almost regardless of price. So it's funny if the Fed is really interested in fighting inflation, which is one of their mandates, if you believe what they say, this, this does nothing for that because you're right, rate cuts don't help supply problems and ultimately prices go up. I mean, just think about real estate, right? The business that we're in. How much of the drywall and wood and the stuff that goes into a home comes from China and now we have supply disruption? Well, the yeah. good news is construction workers generally have a plan B, but plan B is more expensive. Uh, and where does that lead? Well, that means prices have to go up. So, I mean, it's a sneaky well, thing that this could be inflation in the months well, to come. maybe... But maybe that's what the Fed is thinking, actually. If, everything, if the price of everything is going to go up, mm. then they want to reduce interest rates to try to fight that. Although I agree with I, you. It, doesn't, it, seems, it seems a little bit like it's just going to fuel inflation if you just increase the money supply when there's a, you know, increase the supply of money <laughs> when there's a, a, a supply yeah. constraint on goods. Yeah. It, right? it, first off, they're not thinking about inflation. They are thinking about, oh, my God, the economy just hit a brick wall. What do we do? And let's talk about that. One of the things that I talk about all the time on my daily videos is I only, I only really, I read every day, but I read for mm -hmm. two things, cost of capital. And without question, cost of capital has gone down and gone down significantly today. And the other one I'm looking for is consumer behavior because the consumer in the US economy is 66 to 70%, depending on who you read, oh. of the economy. And the consumers are changing behavior drastically. That is a problem. That is going to have ripple effects in so many different places that we don't know. I saw a note the other day that the New York Times is seeing less ad revenue because of the virus, which is really? like, how the heck do you see that coming? Right? People are buying more, reading more, Netflixing and chill and all this stuff at home, but yet advertisers, but, so you ask yourself why that is. I think that is because advertisers are conserving cash. Yeah. Because Cash is going to be the lifeblood. Yes, we all agree that this is likely a short-term, one-time, black swan, six, nine-month issue. But if you can't survive nine months, you're out of business. Well, so that's, this is the danger, 
really. So the, the, the danger is a secondary effect, right? Yeah. So the, the secondary effect is the crazy over leveraging of like American business. Yes. Right now. The, the, you know, the low interest rates combined with the, the huge tax cut, from a couple of years ago yeah. have led companies to borrow money for the purposes of buying back their own stock. Yes. Right. Which, so they are many, many companies, you know, I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but I've been reading about this issue. Many, many companies, I mean, a huge number of companies in the United States are, are over leveraged to the point where is where if, and they all have floating rate debt, right? Yes. So this is good for them in the short term. Short term. And that's a problem. That also may be another thing the fed is thinking about yes. is, reducing their debt burden because if they start making less money they're going to have to you know that now that i think about it, that that really that might make sense yes kind of what the fed is thinking about here because they're they're looking at all of the over leveraged companies and understanding that any bad economic news is going to send a lot of them into insolvency you right? got it and they will not be able to make their debt service yep and um so basically we've had like bad government policy compounding bad government policy for 10 years now. Yeah. And we've, it's now put us in this situation where we like, you know, a large number of American companies cannot afford any economic bad news at all yep. because they have so much debt. Now, on the other hand, you've got a lot of companies that have been just piling up cash because frankly, there's nothing, worth investing in right they have no there's no there's no good use for that cash mm -hmm. other than maybe stock buybacks but they're they can't figure out like good things that are worth investing in so they're just sitting on money mm -hmm. but there's a lot of other companies that are heavily heavily indebted indebted and if interest rates were to go up or if uh if sales were to go down they would not be able to make their debt service and that would have that would be the thing that would really put the american economy into serious recession, not, not kind of a, a small, you know, slowdown. So yeah. that, that's maybe now that we talk about it, why the Fed I think, is cutting I, rates. I think that's exactly why the Fed cut rates is because they saw the debt burden. They want to lower the debt burden, the monthly spend on all this over ledger's debt. But I want to talk about the, something you just brought up is that's the cash heavy companies. And the one that is most often talked about, there's two that are most often talked about Apple and then obviously Berkshire Hathaway or, or Buffett. Um, and I want to talk about Buffett specifically. Sure. Uh, um, because the people that have been making fun of him the last year for having $138 billion, or whatever his cash balance is, are about to just see the genius of Warren Buffett. I suspect his phone is going to start to be ringing around tax day, April 15th, with companies going, oh my God, I can't make payroll. I can't do this. I can't do that. Please buy me for pennies on the dollar. I suspect he's going to deploy half his cash stack and buy some amazing companies because they were run by executives who made short-term decisions and now can't, can't pay their bills. He's going to be proven once again to be the guy sitting in the catbird seat. I mean, look at what he did with Goldman in the crash, right? Yeah. Can you imagine getting what it was 10% in warrants at a 20% discount that made him, I mean, yeah. people just stop picking on Warren Buffett. He is smarter than you and I without well, question. Well, listen, it's like, like Seth Klarman also, mm -hmm. right? And Seth Klarman, has made, you know, incredible returns over most of his career. Although like Warren Buffett, the last few years, not as much, but I think it's because, yeah. you know, this kind of crazy Fed policy destroys the price discovery mechanism and it hurts value investors because mm -hmm. it just makes all the, the crazy momentum investors and the people who just aren't thinking that much and think that, you know, who are lucky and think they're good, you know, just buy more stuff. And it, 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 it makes it difficult for value investors to buy. So it looks bad right now, but Seth Klarman has done so well over the course of his career because he's always so much, he has so much cash on hand. He's not fully invested. He has an enormous cash reserve so that when these black swan events happen mm -hmm. and he can buy really good companies at, for a fraction of their previous trading price, then he's got, he's able to do it. And and he wouldn't be able to do it if he'd invested all that money at the top of the market. And then the market goes down and the value is destroyed. Exactly. Like, this is what people don't seem to get. They're like, they're like, we have, oh, I have to invest every penny I have in an asset right now because I'm going to miss out on something. Well, this is what happens. A double, you get a, when the, when the asset prices fall, then you have a basically 
a, a, a double hit, right? Mm -hmm. One is that you, you're, the value is destroyed. You've just lost all that cash. Mm -hmm. And the second is that now you also don't have the cash to buy the stuff when it's really cheap, when you're really going to make money. Exactly. And it's when you buy right? people, it is when you buy. <laughs> it is when you buy. And, and listen, I have, a, I have a very close friend who is a very, very well-known value investor. And I'm not allowed to mention his name because he'd get upset with me, but um, he, 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 uh, when the crash happened back, you know, a decade ago, he had just, he'd been in New York for years. He'd then been in London for about a, a, a decade, maybe about five years. And then he had just been hired for basically his dream job and come back and move back to New York. And like a week or two after he moved, literally, it was like a week or he was still like unpacking boxes and, and the Lehman collapse happened. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So I, so, you know, of course he was super busy and I remember talking with him and I was like, yeah, in my own ignorance, I said, wow, are, are you, was, he just was like, Jonathan, I've been so busy recently. It's just nuts with everything that's going on. And I said, I said, why are you guys having to like sell a lot of, are you selling a lot of positions? Or he was like, no, we're not selling anything. It's we're <laughs> buying. Yes. The problem is, the problem is we have so much, just trying to figure out what to buy, right? Because we have so much choice now yeah. about, about like what looks good to buy. And also, you know, we're, I think they were also worried about a V-shaped yep. recovery. Yeah. So they wanted to get back in. They wanted to get in as soon as possible. So they were just going nuts trying to buy when, you know, when the stock market had dropped down to 6,500. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. And so that's what value investors live for is those moments. And they make a lot of money. And, they're, you know, so when you talk about Warren Buffett, you know, be, sitting on cash, like he's sitting on cash for this, for this reason. Purpose, he's, yes. Yeah. Now, he's not out of the market, right? He's no. not totally out of the market, but he's building up a big cash position so that he can take advantage of. Yeah. Of these kinds of opportunities. Sam Zell, same thing. Sam yep. Zell is sitting on 3.2 billion. The grave dancer. Yep. Yeah. And you know, I don't hear as much criticism of Sam Zell as you do, maybe just because it's not sort of as public yeah. and, and well known as Warren Buffett, but he's, he's sitting on huge amounts of cash because he's on the yep. one hand saying, I can't find anything that makes sense to buy. And on the other hand, he's like, I know what's coming and I want to be ready yep. for it. You know, another example of this I have is when I was still a lawyer, I was, uh, and this is during actually right before the crash, we, I was working on a litigation involving a hotel here in New York. And uh, it was a strange case where we were actually a third party, but we were kind of like a third party that we were representing a third party. We we're representing actually the third party management company in this dispute between uh, an owner and the union okay. in New York City, the hotel workers union. And it was a situation where, you know, our client was kind of constantly on the verge of being brought into the litigation as a defendant by either one of the parties. And we didn't really know who was going to sue us. And so we were just trying to make nice with both of them. Yeah. And, yeah. and so like sort of cooperating with everybody and, and this sort of thing. And one of the, things I remember talking about with the hotel owner's representative that we were dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis was how, and this was like 2006, when everybody was just like buying real estate left and right and left and right. Yeah. And this guy said, my boss, who was a, it was a single, it was like, you know, rags to riches, American dream story. This guy had come over, not, not the guy I was talking to, his boss had come over from, China as a, you know, with nothing in his pocket and got involved in the garment industry and wound up owning like, you know, thousands of hotel rooms in New York city. Right. Wow. And he was, this guy was selling in the market and he was, he was sitting on $500 million of cash Jeez. because he, and I talking to his, his rep was like, yeah, he, he just, he knows what's coming and he wants to be ready for it. Yeah. And he's just, you know, and I, and then after I, I was out of the case and, and stuff, I mean, later on and after the crash, we weren't involved in this anymore. So I never found out what happened, but I suspect that after the oh, crash, yeah. oh. he went on a buying spree because he was ready for it. No question. And cause that's what he was, you know, that's what he was planning for. Right. Yeah. So, 
and he just made himself probably a billionaire, you know, as a result of that. Easily. So if he wasn't already. And Mm -hmm. so that's, that's the lesson, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, this is a time to pay attention. Uh, Stuff's about to go on sale. Um, I guess, so we talked about the half a point. I want to talk about the, the fact that it came on a Tuesday, non-Fed meeting. Um, I had read that my, I, my thinking is there was obviously a phone call yesterday with the G7, right? So there's mm. the, the seven most powerful countries, arguably. Their Fed people are like we're talking. I believe the intention last night was to get all seven to agree to do a half a point together. Mm. That didn't happen. So the Fed said, all right, we tried and, and they pulled it this morning. That, that's, that's how I read it. And again, the fact that it was an emergency cut when there was a Fed meeting like two weeks away, I don't know how was, that, that's not a good sign, right? The fact they right. did it two weeks early, you can't look at this and think it's a good sign. Yeah, the market maybe had a short term blip, but it's going down because this is an emergency. It is significant. And I just can't look at this as a good thing, except, hey, my debt's going to get cheaper. That's cool. Uh, but it's not good for the economy, I don't, I don't think. What do you think about the emergency nature? Yeah, no, I think clearly the Fed is scared and yeah. wants, to, wants to get ahead of this. Um, and, and like as I said, as we've been talking, I, I feel like I now understand, like we've reasoned out the reason for this emergency rate cut, which yeah. is these overly indebted companies, because it's not going to it's not going to make you or me spend more money. It's not going to make you or me borrow more money. I mean, it will definitely make some, uh, you know, some very aggressive real estate investors out there salivate about buying more assets, which I want to talk about also yes. uh, as yeah. part of this discussion. But um, it's great if you own property and you have the opportunity to refinance right now. It's great if you have an adjustable rate mortgage. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. It's it's great. It's just a windfall, frankly, for a lot of people, and that that's not really going to help the economy a whole lot in in those situations. Um, it's really, like I said, aimed at, or as we said, aimed at trying to pre bail out these companies that have gotten themselves into a really stupid debt situation. Yeah. I, again, I I can envision a time where Disneyland is closed. I mean, I mean, that's how bad I think this is going to get, right? Disneyland will close for a thorough cleaning or whatever it is. Um, just like Disneyland or Disney World or whatever it is in China closed, right, for a long time. You can envision sporting events being played with no crowds, right? I mean, and just think about what that means. That means workers aren't there. That means concessions aren't happening. Merch ain't happening. It's just consumer behavior is changing. And yeah. it's changing in ways I haven't seen in my 30 some years of studying finance and, and business. Um, it's ugly. I, I mean, think. the, the irony is, I mean, I still don't know, like, and again, I'm not a doctor, mm. so I don't know how bad this thing is. It, it seems like it's really more of like another kind of flu strain, essentially. Mm-hmm. Right. That's going to, that kind of has the same. Yeah effect as a flu. It, it, it is deadly for yes. certain people mm-hmm. and probably not deadly for most people. For and sure. the majority. Yeah. Um, and so like you do kind of wonder why we're having such a massive panic around this, yeah. this issue. Is it just because it's the fear of the unknown because it's new and we just, we don't know. I think it, the, uh, you know, I, this the is the effects of it could be yeah, you know what? There's some things I never wrestle with, and that's one of them. All I, I, I watch what consumers do, and right now, the headline yeah. every morning is be afraid, be more afraid, be more afraid, be more afraid. And well, that's a problem with our news media in general, yes. right? And, and probably also like, and, and look, it's not, I don't blame the news media yeah. because, it's, because they're reacting to the human brain, right? I mean, sure. people, humans react to negative stuff more so if you want to sell something look you're you're you know part of your business is marketing part of my business is marketing if you're in Mm -hmm. business you have to understand marketing and you know what do they teach you in in marketing prey on people's fears Mm -hmm. right activate those fear you know and and maybe it's not the fear of death but maybe it's the fear of missing out right missing out yep that's how the gurus get you right the gurus play on the fear of missing out and you know 
real estate's going to go up and up forever. And if you don't get in now and buy my program, then you're going to miss out and you'll never catch up. And like that kind of stuff. That's, it's just, it's just human nature. So like blaming the news media for doing what yeah. works is, is not, uh, isn't helpful. But on the other hand, like it would be good to have some more news sources that are not quite as, yeah. you know, like, a little more focused on kind of delivering helpful information as opposed to just making money. But yeah. 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 Let's uh, so let's transition into multifamily or let's transition into a recession, right? The recession talk. Well, and then let's multi- talk about, let's talk about, let's talk about the effect of the interest rate cuts first okay. Okay, on multifamily. Then let's talk about recession deal in general. I think that, so, uh, so we, we started talking about this just a minute ago, but I mean, obviously I think what's going to happen You've, I'm already seeing it in you know the the chat rooms and stuff on Facebook. The the isn't this wonderful? We're getting another rate cut from the Fed. Let's go buy more multifamily. Yeah. And the the problem with this is there's a couple of problems. One is that, I mean, if you're if you're in the in the middle of a deal right now, this is great. This is just a windfall for you because your no question. interest rate's going to go down, and you know, you're already buying at a pretty low cap rate. So this is going to actually really, if you're already in contract and you have a price that's set, this is great for you because you're going to get, you know, a 50 basis point reduction in your debt. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in, unless the spreads widen to compensate, who knows what will happen. But like, you, you can assume that you're going to get a benefit out of this, sure, right? So sure. that's locking in a better profit for you. But if you're not already in contract, all that's going to happen is that the prices are going to reset. They're going to readjust around an even lower cap rate as everybody as everybody has access to cheaper debt, and yeah. they're just going to bid it up that much more because they're like, "Hey, my debt service is this much lower." And the the problem with that is that as the prices rise, everything else being held equal, you are increasing the not the percentage of debt that you're putting on the property but you're you're increasing your debt load right mm-hmm. and you're uh, so you're just you're 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 increasing the amount of money that you know in, in absolute dollars right that you're liable to owe because the price of the asset is going up even though your interest rates are going down yep so you're setting yourself up for a situation in which kind of like those over indebted companies right you are setting yourself up for a situation where, you know, right now you're paying for, we're in this bizarre situation where the economy is the strongest ever. We've never seen a strong, an economy this strong, how low unemployment is. Look how high rents are, you know, look, nobody wants to buy anymore. Like all this news is, is being uh, put into the price of the asset. Plus we have historically low interest rates or maybe not historically, but really unusually low interest rates. Mm -hmm. And those two factors combined, combined to really, really increase the price of assets, mm-hmm. and 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 the and the price of assets continuing at that level requires all those things to stay the same, mm-hmm. right? It requires the economy to continue to be strong. It requires interest rates to continue to be low. And if either of those things change, then you're going to have something not good happen to the the value of your property, and in some cases, it'll also affect your uh, you know, you're operating profits on the property too. Like if we have a recession and people mm-hmm. can't pay their rent, mm-hmm. then you're in a problem. So I think what <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people are just assuming, and this, this is a natural human tendency. And I, I've written about this too, about, about cognitive biases and in investing, that people have a tendency to assume that whatever is happening now is going to happen forever. So if everything is great now, they think it, they just extrapolate that into the future. If we're in you know, if we've just had a huge stock market crash and everybody's afraid, they extrapolate that into the future, right? So that means that people, your average investor tends to buy when everybody else is buying and buy at the top because mm-hmm. they, they project this all the way into the future. And when the buying opportunity comes and everyone's scared, they are also scared and sitting on the sidelines because they're projecting that forever into the future as well. Mm-hmm. And but right now people are overpaying for assets because they're expecting the situation to continue forever, which we know it will not. And, and what's going on right now may be an indication of that being about to change uh, or not, who knows, but we know that this will not last forever this way. And then it beca- if, you, if you assume it's not going to last forever, then you're really, you're making a speculative bet 
that is going to be like this for long enough that you can stabilize your property, build an equity cushion, build in higher rent so that when it does happen, you're still, you're going to survive. Yeah. Right. So it becomes just, it becomes basically a, a speculative game uh, about how long things will last. So, yeah, I, I love these conversations because your experience is multifamily and big multifamily. I have some biggest I own is 20. So no, nowhere on the same scale, but where I, where I spend the days now are single family homes and it's almost the reverse, right? Today, or at least if not today, certainly by the middle of March, I fully expect open houses to be less busy. I expect mm -hmm. buying of, of new build homes to be less because people are going to be afraid. And that's why I watch the consumer because the consumer is my competitor for single family homes. And I believe single family home buyers are not going to sign up for a big mortgage right now. They're going to be like, no, I'm going to chill for a couple of months. Just wait and see. Wait I'm going to wait and yeah. see. I'm nervous. My, my, you know, I, you just don't know. So it's funny. Multifamily buyers are looking to, as a good thing, let's, let's go get aggressive. Let's sign up for more of a debt load. I believe in single family, I'm going to have less competition. I'm going to be able to find the motivated seller easier. And I expect to be very aggressive uh, between, call it, like April and June, uh, because I believe the headlines are going to scare mom and pop and mom and pop aren't going to be buying homes. And it's, it's going to be, I feel like it's going to be not quite as good as 2010, which was my most active year for buying homes, but it's going to be close. And uh, I am looking forward to that. Well, that is, this is why this is great for me talking to you too, because that, that is something I never would have thought of. And I think you're absolutely right. Like that, that this is, people are not going to want to, they're just going to go into this, you know, it's the retreat. Like Con the, conservation, the take, conserve. Yeah. yeah, just like take, it's the take cover and wait and see thing. And it's funny because I've been noticing, I think I mentioned before, like, I, you know, I've been looking to, to buy a new house for, for my family. Yeah. And, and so I've been following the listings a lot. And I've noticed, you know, I guess because it's, it's early in the year, a lot of listings are coming on the market right now. Yeah. And, uh, but now with this coronavirus thing, we're going to see, you know, I also noticed some sales picking up a little bit too. Like a lot sure. of stuff have been sort of languishing on the market for a while. And all of a sudden, a lot of the properties I've been following are now, they've now listed as pending. Mm -hmm. So people are starting to, to make deals again now that it's getting to be spring. But I, you know, it never occurred to me that this coronavirus would affect the, the housing market. And I think you're absolutely right. I oh, think it will. Are gonna no be, question. Are going to be, you know, nervous about going to open houses because they don't want to catch anything. Yep. They're going to be just nervous about, in general, like what's coming. Maybe I shouldn't make a move yet. I'll wait and see. Yep. And so if you're a single family home buyer, it could be a really good time for you to get, uh, you know, to get some assets. I'm actually thinking like, you know, maybe I should go out looking aggressively and trying to get a, you know, a, a contingency in the contract for, you know, contingent on the sale of my house. Yeah. So I could just, last it, you know, to take as long as it takes yeah. to sell our property so we can do something else. Cause I think, you know, those yeah, contingencies I, might come I, back I, too. You know, I am, I am fairly confident given my history that what's going to play out over the next four to five months in the single family market is inventory is going to rise uh, yeah. because people, sometimes you just got to sell buyers are going to retreat and uh, you are going to be able to make deals with, Oh, by the way, the lowest interest rates ever. Yeah. And look like a genius in three to four years. Um, now, not everybody has to sell. That's, that's the magic of this time. And that's why you have to make lots right. of offers. But there will be people that have to sell. And in a hot market, they don't have to take 100 grand or 200 grand or 50 grand, depending on what market you're in. But in a market where buyers are scarce, which is what I think is going to happen, you, you can get 10, 15, 20% discounts all the time. I, yeah. I know I've invested in that market before and I see it coming. Yeah, for all those people who moved to take a new job, who, you know, are retiring, yeah. who are, you know, estate sales, whatever, all those all those sales that have to happen where people are not like me, like I don't have to sell my apartment. Yeah. But I you know, but for people who are you know, I would like to, but yeah. I don't have to. Just but for just, people who have to. Yeah, go know? go back and look at the stats. I think it's a it, it, I mean for guys who are in the business. Go back and look at like 2009 and 10. Uh, I, I'll, I'll remember them close enough. They won't be exact. But of the transactions that transpired, 60% of them were foreclosures or short sales. 
but in that 2010. Me- yeah, that means 40% wow. was still natural sales. Do you think that mm-hmm. 40% really wanted to sell in a market that was falling two to 3% a month? No, yeah. they had to. And how do you compete? You slash your price because me as a buyer, I don't care if I buy it from a bank or you, it doesn't matter as long as the price works. And yeah. sometimes you just got to sell. And uh, that is a wonderful time to be a buyer. Well, I don't know what you've been seeing in your market out there, but in Brooklyn, certainly for the last six months or so, prices have been, I mean, everything's got a price kind of attached to it. If you look on Trulia, everything has a price cut attached it's to it. It's just started. Yeah. And now, but now, and, and that was before this coronavirus happened. Like yep. people had already started feeling a bit saturated or just like, hey, these prices are, I'm just not paying it. I, I saw something too recently about the Boston market where, where my, my brother is very active as a, as a realtor in the Boston market. And so I, I saw something posted about how buyers have just kind of reached their limit. They're just yep. like, I'm not paying it. I just yep. don't want to pay it. So I'm not going to. And yep. that's causing the market there to adjust. And I think that, and again, coronavirus is going to. It's going to be gasoline on a campfire. It's yeah. going to happen. It's going to happen. So whew, good times. Well, so let, good time. Yeah, great times. So <laughs> yeah. let's, let's, let's talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, which is um, how multifamily performs in a recession. Yes. So this is something where I've been pushing back on the mainstream narrative for a couple of years, uh, trying to get people to listen to facts rather than hype. Yeah. About, about multifamily. And so one of the, one of the narratives that has been pushed uh, in this up cycle and it's been pushed, you know, the closer we get to the top and the the longer we stay at this kind of prolonged sort of plateau at the top and and people are naturally concerned about what happens in recession. because we haven't had one for a long time. The more this narrative has been pushed that multifamily does well in a recession. And this narrative comes from a single data point, which is the last crash mm. in, you know, in the, the early part of this century. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the only data point it comes from. It does not come from earlier data points. It, is <coughs> not, it, is not, it is not, does not come from looking at how multifamily has performed in every recession in the mm-hmm. past. It's only from the great financial crisis. And well, let me, let me tell you sort of what the argument is, and then mm-hmm. I'll tell you why the argument is wrong. So the argument it has basically been very simplistic and looking at the performance of rentals in the aftermath of the great financial crisis and saying multifamily did re- really well, therefore it does well in recessions. Mm-hmm. And the argument people make is, oh, well, people get uh, foreclosed on and they have to rent or all the people who would be buying have to rent because they don't want to buy or they can't qualify for a mortgage, mm-hmm. or they downsize. They go from, you know, they go find a cheaper place to live. Mm-hmm. And certainly some of that happened the last time around, but it, the, the key thing to remember is it didn't happen during the recession. Correct. It happened after the recession, right? It happened after the recovery got underway mm-hmm. and you started seeing a shift in people's ability to buy foreclosures, what happened, but Mm -hmm. what happened? So people just sort of very simplistic. I think, I think the problem is that, you know, it's now 10 years past people kind of conflate a lot of things together. And, and for, for sure, the, the economy was kind of crappy for a long time and people in their minds think of the recession as having lasted for much longer than it really did which is pretty typical, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, th- I remember as, even as a kid that, you know, in the early 80s when we had a really bad recession, uh, people, the, even after the recession was over and the recovery had started, people still thought of us being in a recession because yeah. unemployment was still high, but right. it, was, it was trending down, right? And the same thing happened last time around where unemployment was ticking down month after month after month, but it was still high and people, you know, felt it didn't feel good. So people thought, we're in a recession. Mm -hmm. And during that time, as, as things were getting better then people were moving into apartments. Right. But there were a number of really unusual factors that led 
that led into this situation, which is why I don't think this is going to repeat. And you can't generalize and say that recessions are good for multifamily. Mm. The, the, the first one that is generalizable across all recessions is that people lose jobs. They don't have money to pay rent, right? That is going to happen in the next recession. It, it happened in the last recession and occupancy went down in the last recession as it does in every other recession. This is like, you, you can mark my words on this. You can go look at the stats yourself if you want to. Mark my words, if there is a recession, occupancy is going to go down, right? Because people don't have money to pay for mm -hmm. rent. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, economic occupancy is going to go down. Economic occupancy is, you know, the difference between the amount of money that you should collect if you're 100% full and the amount of money that you're actually collecting. You will have a lot of tenants who are there living in your apartment, not paying you rent, mm -hmm. right? So your vacancy may still look good, but you're not going to bring in as much money, mm -hmm. right? And in some circumstances, you may actually not care because yeah. it is better for you to have an apartment that somebody's living in and at least paying utilities on than to have a vacant apartment that's deteriorating, right? So in certain circumstances, you may not actually be so aggressive about pursuing a uh, uh, an eviction mm -hmm. just because it's still better for you to potentially have somebody living there than having the apartment literally just like rotting because nobody is in it, yeah. right? So, so that will happen. Yeah. But in the last recession, now, what you have to understand about the last recession is that is what preceded the last recession, which is home ownership going to an all time high of 70% mm -hmm. because of what was going on in the mortgage markets, mm -hmm. right? And, and government policy pushing home ownership. You know, home ownership in the United States has historically always been 63 to 65%. Correct. In the, in the, the few years before the last recession, it went all the way to 70%. Mm -hmm. So 5% of the population that normally would be renters became homeowners who really arguably should never have been homeowners, right? Mm -hmm. And they did it because of like liar loans and teaser loans yeah. and all kinds of stuff that got people who should have been renting to buy houses. Yeah. And what happened when the crash happened? Well, all those people went back into multifamily. So we're into rentals, right? So mm -hmm. you, you had... This enormous, you know, 5% of the population, I mean, how many millions of people? So we've got, you know, 300 million people in the country. That's 15 million people right there. Uh, wait, more than that, my math is wrong. Right? No, it's 15 million people, right? Mm -hmm. Right there that suddenly we're going to became renters. Yeah. Right? And, and who would have been renting all along if it weren't for this crazy thing that happened beforehand. Yeah. At the same time, if you look at, so multifamily vacancies were around like, you know, 92, 91% mm -hmm. before the recession because everyone's buying houses, right? Exactly. So if you were buying multifamily before then, you were basically buying below intrinsic value because a bunch of your, the people who were, should have been renting weren't renting, yeah. right? So you were getting stuff cheaper if you were buying on actual NOI numbers. Mm -hmm. Then, so you bought well, and then the recession happened and a bunch of people moved back into multifamily, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, that's not gonna happen again because we're down at 63. Everyone who's renting is already renting. I mean, everyone's going to rent is already rent. And arguably we've got, we're now, we've gone below that where there are people who really should be buying homes mm -hmm. who are not mm -hmm. because uh, of sort of everything that's happened. So we're actually down a couple of percentage points over the long-term right. home ownership. Uh, but even if that's not true, even if the percentage stays down where it is around 63%, you know, multifamily is, at, you know, you've got occupancies now, you know, 98, 99%, like market wide, it's like 96, 97%. Yep. This is way higher than the long term average. There is nowhere for it to go but down, yes. right? It's not going to go up because we have a recession. Yeah. And on top of that, I mean, you think about what happens if you're, if you're a, a rental owner, someone applies to, uh, to rent from you. The first thing you're going to ask is, where do you work? Yeah. And if they say, oh, I don't have a job, then you're going to say, see ya, right? Yep. Or if, they, if, they're, if their hours have been cut or their wages have been cut to preserve their job, but they, now they don't qualify to rent in your place, you're going to say, you know, move on to the next place. This place isn't for you. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so this idea that like, you know, 
unemployment is going to go up and somehow this is going to be good for multifamily doesn't make sense. All those other things aside that I just said about how there was this unusual 5% of the population that should have been renting all along that wasn't that suddenly came back into, into rentals. Mm -hmm. Right. But the other thing that, you know, that happens in, in a recession is people say, Oh, people are going to move to cheaper apartments. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let's see about this one. Now let's just say that you are like, uh, let's let's go through a couple of scenarios right let's say that you are like uh upper middle class renter right mm -hmm. a couple of things first of all when the recession hits you're probably not going to lose your job because those are typically not the people who get who lose their jobs so you're not moving anywhere uh, if you do lose your job you probably have a lot of savings to fall back on so you can continue to pay your rent right mm -hmm. at least you know you've got a few months of savings for months, so you can continue yep. to pay for a few months. You'll be able to pay your rent while you're looking for another job. And because you're in that, that class of people, you'll probably find a job relatively quickly, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to move. Third thing is, let's just think about like the status of the situation. You're probably, if you're like a class A or class B plus renter, you're probably not going to move. Like you're, you're not, unless you're desperate. Right. Right. You're not going to do that because mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's a status hit. Like yeah. you're not going to, you know, and you'll be worried about crime and your schools friend, yeah. and all those yeah, other yeah, things. Your, whole your friends, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're not going to do that. Right. Let's then go down like a notch. Let's just say for people who are, are down a notch, who might be a little more price sensitive and might start thinking about moving to a cheaper place. Well, if you have a lease, you can't break the lease without serious penalties. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you break the lease and you try to rent at the next place and they say, I want references from your last landlord, and then you call the landlord and they say they skipped on me or they broke the lease, mm -hmm. then you're going to say, See yeah, ya. pass, yeah. right? So that's not as like, so there might be, there's going to be like a lag time even for people who want to sort of downsize price wise, yeah. there's only a few, a, a small number of people who are going to be able to immediately move because their leases are expiring. Right. And so, so that's not going to really happen. And if you go down the, the sort of the third notch where you get into like your pure C properties, mm -hmm. those are the properties that will be hardest hit by a recession because it's that class of, of tenant that is most likely to get fired in a recession. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Those are the the service jobs and manufacturing jobs are the easiest to cut yep. during recessions because it's you're you're talking about people who don't have you know special skills that you want to hold on to right right if you're talking about people at the top end of you know the income structure a lot of those people are highly skilled and and companies will make the decision like to continue to pay the salary even though the because they know that the, the work will come back yep. and they don't want to lose that person. But if you're working as a cashier or, mm -hmm. you know, other kind of like service job or, you know, manufacturing job, that's not like a highly skilled one, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're just a number to those companies. Oh, absolutely. And so, so those people are likely to get cut and they have nothing to fall back on because we know that the average American can't survive a $400 unexpected expense. Right. So, they don't have any savings to fall back on to continue to pay the rent. And you're not the people who are, who are thinking like, Oh, well, there are going to be all these people coming down from class B to save my ass. You're deluding yourself yeah. by thinking that. Cause it's not, it's just not, it's not like people can just suddenly move because either they're locked into a lease or they don't want to, they, they don't want to take the status hit of moving down or they don't have to. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. So that, even though it may eventually happen that some people will filter down, yeah. you may, you may already be in foreclosure by the time it happens, because if exactly. you, if you don't, if you've got six months where you don't make your debt service, or even frankly, if you fall too far below your debt service coverage ratio, like even if you're paying your debt, mm -hmm. the lender may still kick you out yeah. and force you to sell. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so this is where, now, if you look at this combination of two things where people are buying at these inflated asset prices at mm -hmm. the top of the market with a potential recession coming, and they're deluding themselves that this is okay because, oh, multifamily does well in a recession, you have to think about 
what's really going on with that statement, multifamily does not do well in a recession. It, made, it did well in the aftermath of the last recession because of those unusual circumstances yeah. that were present then. But you know, I remember a couple of years ago going to my property manager, who's a guy who's been in the business for almost 40 years, is on the national board of the National Apartments Association, you know, knows a thing or two about multifamily. And, and after hearing this multifamily does well in a recession and getting so much pushback when I said to people, this doesn't make any sense, I went to, to Mike and I was like, Mike, all right, I, am I crazy? Who's the crazy one? Is it me or is it those people? And he was, I said, does multifamily do well in a recession? He just sort of like laughed at me. Like, yeah. like of course, you know, your occupancy goes down in a recession. And, yeah. you know, it's so it's yeah that, that's a rant that i go on from time to time i haven't had a chance to do that rant for a while um does it feel it, good it, does it feel good it feels good <laughs> it feels so good to talk about this because yeah. you know we've had the, the recession fears kind of dissipated for a little while yeah. so it became less relevant um well, but, well let me tell you about my actual experience so this yes, is let's not hear about your actual this experience. is not theory this is one person's uh, experience i probably had a hundred apartments combined in my portfolio. I also had houses. Also, my experience is pre-crash and post-crash. So yeah. I was taking notes throughout your conversation. So first and foremost, uh, you are absolutely right about renters, that 5%. Mm -hmm. The hardest time to be a landlord in apartments was 2006, when liar loans and teaser loans were at their peak. Because people could buy a house for less than first month's rent uh, and deposit. Hmm. It's the only time in my 20 year history I've had to offer move in specials. So that little window was a problem. Now, those people came back when those two years were up and they had to refi and rates went from one to seven or whatever happened. So, absolutely, your, your assumption is absolutely correct. That 5% was our artificial, 7%, whatever it is, the 30, 15 million people. Absolutely right. Um, at owning a hundred units into a recession sucks because what happens is occupancy and economic occupancy are not the same, right? Heartbeats versus checks mm -hmm. aren't equal. And um, people in apartments, and again, I, I'm in a unique situation because I had about 50 or 60 houses and I had a hundred units, right? So the, here's the fact. People fought harder to stay in a house than they did to stay in an apartment. Interesting. What happened- Why was that? Why was that? Because owning a home, or not owning, but renting a home was a status thing. Just like your A-class mm. apartments, people, people in a home, they invited people who were in apartments to come live in a bedroom. Come live in a multi-generational house with me, sister, mother, mm. grandma. My apartment dwellers most often stopped paying rent, which meant they got two months free because I'm in California because it takes that long to get them out, which, oh, by the way, stretched to 90 days because everybody was in evictions or lots of people were. So they got three months free. And then when eviction happens, they moved into the brother's or sister's or mother's house. My effective occupancy in houses was at a record high. Hmm. I do not remember a single eviction during that time. I'm sure it happened once, but not many. I had dozens of evictions across a portfolio of 100 units which was terrible because we all know being a landlord in apartments is what turns kill you, right? Yeah. So if you had an oh, eviction God. plus yeah. non-payment and then a turn, you're broke. Yeah. Uh, and, and people who are buying today at the top of the market, um, you're going to lose your apartments unless you are oodles rich and you're doing 50% down or something unnatural, you're going to lose them. It's you, just going to happen. You have to go in with, low leverage. Oh. I saw, you know, I made a comment. I usually don't comment in other people's Facebook groups that I belong to, but today somebody was asking in one of the other groups about what, what level of leverage they should go in to a multifamily property at. Mm -hmm. And they were asking like, you know, can I get 85, 90%? Oh. And, and I, and I, I said, no. And of course, and then of course, like all the private money no, lenders jumped in and like, Oh yeah, I'll give you, oh, I'll give you 150%. Like, you know, at 2% interest, you know, yeah, whatever. Just so, uh, but I, I, I said, look, no, you should be going into, if you're going to buy now, you should be going into like 60, no more than 65% leverage. Yeah, no more and, than, and hopefully because less. Because you, you really have to, you have to anticipate that 
correction that's coming and you want to have, you want to be able to make your debt service and you want to be able to, you, know, you need that equity cushion yeah. so that you can ride out whatever's coming. Um, yeah. You know, because look, you know, people say, oh, you know, oh, the other thing I forgot to mention about like, does multifamily do well in a recession? I think mo 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 most people are talking about is sort of like their, their rental income. Mm -hmm. Does it, does it do well or not? We've already kind of destroyed that. Yeah. Um, but the, the other thing is that people should understand that uh, cap rates will rise and you're going to take a big hit equity wise. Oh, huge and, hit. And, and if you're, and if you're, if you, if you have long-term <laughs> debt locked in, you can write it out. But if you have to refinance in the middle of that, you're going to be in big oh, trouble. And trouble. all you have to do, if anybody doesn't believe me about how much they can, your, uh, your, um, your, your value can fall, go to the green street, uh, green street capital advisors. I think they're called. They have a commercial property price index mm. that goes back more than a decade. And you can just see mm. they, 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 they set, the reference point is the, the previous market peak, okay. in like 2006. Mm -hmm. That's that's 100. You can see not only like how inflated we are compared to that now, but you can also see how things dropped. And oh, yeah. in, in the last recession, commercial property, including multifamily, dropped about 35% that's in value. Easy. Right? Which is yeah. more than usual. And that was usually, it's, if you look at like, like uh, the, the index for houses run by, uh, by Schiller, um, mm -hmm. typical recession, you give back 30%, mm -hmm. with typical, uh, sorry, not recession, typical correction. Yep. But that commercial property actually went down 35% overall from, from peak to trough. Uh, and so, you know, the idea that like you're, you're going to sail through is, no. is so lock in that long-term debt, right? Yes. I mean, if interest, if you're like, if you're one of those people out there who's like interest rates just dropped 50 basis points today, I got to go get me some multifamily. If you do that, like, please, by all means, don't go in with the most leverage you can get and don't go in with any kind of short term debt. You got to no. go in with lo the longest term debt you can get, lock it in so that you at least know like what your payment is going to be and you can, you can ride out whatever's coming. But if you have to refinance in the middle of whatever's coming, you are going to lose that property. No or you're going to have to come up with a lot more equity in order to refinance. Yeah. So I, uh, I've shared this before when you and I talk, I'm raising cash. Uh, I may even sell some more apartment buildings if people want to give me stupid prices. Uh, because again, I bought during the, the bottom, I added 50 units of apartments for almost nothing down. Uh, and it'll happen again. And um, yeah, a multifamily does not do well in a recession. Just stop the madness. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. I, I mean, I also don't want to say it, it tanks. It does terribly. No. Right. But, but I think, I think that like what you have to understand is it's not, it's not, it, it is, it has some recession resistant characteristics mm -hmm. and it does better than a lot of other commercial property that's dependent on businesses, oh, for sure. which disappear altogether. Right. Yeah. So it'll, it'll do better than retail. It'll do better than hotels for sure. in recession, mm -hmm. it'll do better than, you know, office in some cases, you know, like, you know, if you got office built class A office building that's all rented to like top notch companies that aren't going anywhere, you're fine. But other than that, you know, multifamily is relatively resistant compared to those other things. Right. Right. But I think a lot of people have and multifamily was you now listen to these words. Multifamily was the best performing asset during the recession of every uh, of every class of, of uh, real estate, right? Mm -hmm. The best performing. But what does that mean? That means it didn't fall as much. Exactly. Right? So it only it only it only fell by about thirty five percent compared to other asset classes, which fell more. Absolutely. Right. So, so and what's happened though is that that's another thing that's fed into this narrative of it doing well. Mm. People have seen the headline: multifamily did the best in a recession, and they assume that that means it did well in an absolute sense, not in a relative sense. So yeah. they combine all those things so with all the stuff we talked about before. And hey, multifamily does great in recessions. It doesn't do great in recessions. It, it can be resistant if you set yourself up right. If you set yourself up right in the first place. So low leverage, long-term debt, locked in, fixed rate. Yeah. You know, buying good, really well-located properties. Don't buy any C properties now. You know, like all that kind of stuff. Like go for really well-located B, B plus deals with low leverage and long-term debt. You know, which basically everybody who's smart is trying to do. So the prices are really high. But yeah. Um, you know, it's, it don't, don't be fooled by the, yeah, you know, you'll be fine. Yeah.
uh, yeah. that people are talking about out there. Jonathan, I always appreciate our weekly conversations. This expert series is something I look forward to every week. Uh, we talked about the half point cut emergency and multifamily in a recession. Thank you very much for uh, your time this week. You're welcome. It's always great talking to you, Michael. You got it.